Genesis chapter 4, we began this study in September, and this is how God works in us as He reveals stuff. I need to uh, do correct, correct something that uh, uh, needs to be corrected. The discussion last week was later on about uh, Cain's wife giving birth to Enoch or Enosh in Hebrew, and it's not the same one. There are parallels between Seth's son and the naming of his children and Cain's son, son's and the naming of his children, and they're very parallel because one is the authentic lineage of Messiah and the other one is the counterfeit. And so when you understand this, and under, listen, and we talked about this, I, I preached a sermon, uh, not this week, but the week before last, talking about how many times names are similar in the Bible, and we talked about the one name that nobody had ever heard of before, and the name was of the character of the Bible called someone else. And so if you didn't hear that message called, are you the reluctant prophet, you need to hear that because as you look throughout the Bible, you're going to see references. Even Moses said, listen, uh, can't you send someone else? Right? And whether or not you want to be someone else in this year. So a great character of the Bible, all over the Bible, all over the congregation. And uh, will you make a decision in 2013 to not be the same person you were last year, but will you step into that calling of being someone else. So in that, I talked about how many different names there were, but only half of the names of the Bible are original names. Many people are named many things. There's many Elijahs and many Enochs and many of these various names. So you have to make sure that in the genealogies, you remember which one you're talking about. So I want to make sure that the uh, CD reflects that. <clears throat> we're in Genesis chapter 4. And remember, we talked about that, le- that uh, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and lived in the land of Nod east of Eden. And some of you are quite stimulated by the fact that I said that everybody who ever left God went in an easterly direction, and everyone who returned to God returned west. Quite interesting that when, they put, when God put the cherubim with the flaming swords in front of the Garden of Eden, where was it? It was on the east side because they departed through that east gate. If they would have gone west, he would have put it west. If they would have gone north, he would have put it north, but they went out. They could not return west back into the presence of God. We were cut off. When do you get readmitted? When you say yes to Messiah. That's when you get to eat from the tree of life. What does the tree of life give you? It gives you eternal life. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. If you don't connect the dots back to the Garden of Eden, it was so important, and then it's never mentioned again. Of course it's mentioned again. You have to understand what occurred there. You're going to see as we continue to read the, the limitation on life that God puts on man, you begin to understand how truly cut off we were from eternal life. Just because somebody lived 900 years, that was temporary. When somebody began then to live 120 years or three score and ten, it became much more limited. And so life is precious, and because we don't acknowledge the preciousness of life, we do so much and take so much for granted that we waste many, many opportunities to walk in the full blessing of God. And He wants us to count every second. Teach me to number my days. Isn't that what the Scripture says? Teach me to number my days. And so this is a a pattern. So Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and lived in the land of Nod. Remember the curse on Cain was that the land would not yield to him. Therefore, what did he have to do? He had to build on the land. He tried to subdue the earth by building upon it. Who made the earth? God. Who laid the foundation of the earth? God. Cain tried to build on someone else's foundation. Was Cain successful at building it? He was not. He had to leave it, and his son took over. He could not finish the work that he started himself, and we'll read about that. And so we need to understand who these people are and what was going on in their life. So we're in the line of Cain. Why do we study the line of somebody? In Hebrew, it's called toldot, T-O-L-D-O-T, the toldot, the generations. When you read in Matthew you read the generations. When we understand the generations, we begin to understand the layers of civilization. When we go to Israel, we go and we go to Tel Dan. Tel is just a short word for Toldot, the Tel. It's layers of civilization that have been peeled back through archaeological digs that they peel it back, they peel it back, they peel it back, yet never destroying the civilization that was there. So when they peel it back, they peel it back at an angle. 
so that you may walk in current dirt and you may see the layers of civilization. It's quite fascinating when you walk in the land of Israel and you see, literally see with your eyes and you plant your feet on layers of you walk in ancient paths. When you go to uh, Beersheba, when you go to uh, the ruins uh, up of, uh, of uh, Herod's um, uh, Caesarea, Philippi and Caesarea, the Caesareas around the, uh, uh, the Galilee region and, and up north, you're walking on ancient paths and you see things and different than Greece where you see the ruins and that's what you're looking at in Greece is ancient ruins. What you're looking at in Israel is not ruins at all, but it's civilization that's, that's, that's uh, identifying biblical truth. The deeper they go, the further down they go, the wider they go, the more they confirm archaeologically what we already have been told in the Bible. If you look online and find the ten greatest discoveries in Israel over the past year, and every year they do a highlight of the ten greatest archaeological discoveries, you're going to find that all of them relate to the Bible. All of them. Because what do you match it up to? How do you match up archaeology to, what, history? Man writes the history books, right? God wrote the Bible. And so when you find out that everything being discovered confirms what is written in this historical document. That's why it's called history. His story. It's not our story, it's his story. And when it all lines up and you begin to marvel at this, when we walk in the rabbi's tunnel underneath the western wall, we begin to walk in an area that rabbis of old walked in. When we go to the western wall and we pray at the hotel, when we stand on the Mount of Olives and we look down and we see the eastern gate, we know that even below the eastern gate, underneath that Muslim cemetery, is the original eastern gate. And then we begin to wonder, how will God supernaturally open it? Well, He closed it. He says in Ezekiel, He closed it because the prince had already died there. Who was the prince? Yeshua. All this confirmed, and so we study the lineage, the lines, so that we understand the authentic, and we also understand the counterfeit. Because in God's economy, there's always going to be. Remember, God formed the light. He created the darkness. Some people are drawn to the darkness. You wouldn't have satanic worship if there wasn't people drawn to the darkness. You wouldn't have all this occult stuff if people weren't drawn to the darkness. You wouldn't have these uh, societies that require you to take a secret oath, a secret vow, a secret impartation, where you can't disclose that to anybody, otherwise you'll violate the covenant that you've made with what? The organization. Yeshua says, swear by what? Nothing. Can't swear by heaven or by earth. Let your yes be no, yes and your no be no. One time a year we have a service called Kol Nidre, where we disavow all vows that we've made so that we can be released, that when we can come into this newness of the season of forgiveness and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Oh, well, that's just a religious observance. Well, when I read in Leviticus 23 and, and in Deuteronomy, it tells me that this is for me and for the alien living among me. Oh, that's an everlasting covenant for all generations, no matter where you live. See, some things were incorporated into the new covenant that God said, this shall never pass away. The flowers will wither, or the grass will wither and the flowers will fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. You need to understand this. You need to understand this Ten Commandments. You need to understand the Ten Commandments were just a part and parcel to the 613. One set of commands, 613 in total. You can't pick the ten and throw out the 603. No more than you can pick the Bible and say, well, I'm just going to hold on to uh, uh, the book of Matthew. I'm throwing all the other, the other books away because they're irrelevant in my life. It's not the pick and choose. I have the pick and choose Bible, the perfect Bible in my office. It's called the perfect Bible, the pick and choose translation. And it's blank. And you just fill out whatever scriptures you want and then that becomes your Bible. So we're in uh, Genesis chapter 4 verse 17. Vayadei Cain et eshtu vatachar vetaled et chanak 
Vehi bon ir veyikra shem ha'ir keshem beno chanak. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Hanak. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Hanak. All right. Remember, uh, it's either Enoch or Enosh. And he, uh, and, and uh, they began to be fruitful and multiply. Yes? And so we read in verse 18, Vayavalad lachanak et erad ve'erad yalad et mikuyael umikayel yalad et mitushayel u mitushayel yalad et lamech. And to Hanak was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mehujael, and Mehujael fathered Methusael, and Methusael fathered Lamech. Irad is a parent of believer in God because he named his son Mehujael. God makes me live. <coughs> but yet, what God? And what evidence did he have of God? And what did he know of God other than his father bore a mark placed upon him by God? Mahujael had a son named Methusael, man of God or man of prayer. And Methusael fathers Lamech, which means warrior or conqueror. This is now the seventh generation from Adam. Lamech takes two, takes two wives, and we're going to read about that in verse 19. And this is the first record of bigamy. First recorded incident of someone taking more than one wife. How interesting. And so we read in verse 19, Vayakach lo lemech, shiti nashim shem ha'achat, adav shem hashenit sila. And Lamech took for himself two wives, the, names of one, the name of one was Ada, and the name of the other Zilha. Lamech's wife Ada means adorned with garments, gave birth to Jabal, whom, which is the name producer. So we're going to read in verse 20 and understand what this lineage is. So now we look at the, who the father is, we look at who the wife is, and now we look at the what? You would know them as the begats, right? Isn't that right? These are the begats. When I came to the Lord, I had no idea. I heard that in a sermon, and so-and-so begat, and I was like, What? The begats, is that like a Broadway show, like the producers? I don't know. In verse 20, Vaitiled Aida et Yaval, Hu Chaya Avi Yoshev Ochel Umikni. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who live in tents and of those who have cattle. He was the father of all nomads, and to Jabal, who originated the use of musical instruments and a pastoral lifestyle, according to the Mishnah, Jabal was an idol maker. Now, why do we look at Mishnah? Why do we look at extra biblical? Because when we begin to see patterns in the lives of those who would be under the covering of God in a certain way, protection of God was, was Cain, who was a sinner, still under God's protective covering. Yes, he was. Well, what kind of grace was this that he would bear the mark and we've already identified what that mark was by connecting the scriptures of the sign. The sign on Cain was the same sign, the same word, and the same reference as used in Exodus chapter 12. What was the sign that was given to God so that he did not dispatch the angel of death? The blood. So there must have been an indelible ink marker on Cain that identified him as someone who was not to die. So if God dispatches the angel of death, it's not, it said God himself passed over. Many of you heard that, oh, it was the angel of death that passed over. No, God himself passed over and did not dispatch the angel of death. So that means that if you are spared because you bear a mark, then the same occurrence happens, the same things occur as they did in Exodus chapter 12. You bear the mark, and therefore God passes over you and does not dispatch the angel of death. Therefore, Cain was not going to be killed because the consequence to the killer would be what? Seven times as worse. 
So we need to understand that under the covering of God, well, would God release you into the hands of evil? You think not? I don't know. I seem to remember a story of Satan going back and forth, and God says, have you considered my son Job? He said, this you can do to him. Everything he has you may take from him, but do not kill him. So Job would bear the mark with the instruction of God. He is the God of blessings and he is the God of curses. And if you follow in the path of blessing and make the choice to walk in blessing, you will be blessed. God's word to Cain are the same words to you. Don't you know that if you do what is right, you will be accepted? Sin is crouching at your door, and it wants to devour you. But you must master it. You can't master it on your own. It's got to be through the strength and the power and the authority, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that comes only through the shed blood of Messiah Yeshua, where he declares in Luke 18 and 19, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing whatsoever can harm you. Well, if you don't have that covering, Cain had whose blood on his hands? Abel's. So it wasn't the shed blood of Messiah that was protecting him. It was the shed blood of his brother that was protecting him. Why? Because the blood, his blood, blood cried out from the ground. When you understand that God himself wrote the Torah, the Torah is a singular entity made up of what we call five books. The Torah is a set of instructions that God gave to those who are getting ready to enter the promised land. And so when we see that, oh, this sounds so similar to Levit Leviticus 17, 11, it's because it's the same author, the same set of instructions contained in the same document. Well, of course it is. If you read the eighth chapter of a book, it should reference characters and events that occurred maybe in the first or second chapter of a book. You wouldn't read a Tom Clancy novel that every chapter is completely different and a whole different set of circumstances event had nothing to do with the other chapter. By the time you got to the third chapter, you go, I'm so confused, I don't know who's who and what's what. Every book you've ever read tells you and introduces you to characters and names and places and dates and times so that you can follow them through to a logical conclusion or a surprise ending. In God's economy, the same author. That means the same style of authorship, the same content. All of it's for instruction. And so when we hear that the blood cries out from the ground, why should we be surprised when we read in Leviticus 17, 11 that the life of the things in the blood and the blood for making atonement, now we should hear the bells go off. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, that was what was going on with Abel's blood. It was the life blood. It was crying out from the ground. So if Abel was to be resurrected, what would God do? He'd put his blood back into his body and lift him up out of the ground. Thus we don't embalm, thus we don't cremate, thus we don't do these things in non-believing Jewish communities, non-believing in Yeshua. So the non-Messianic congregations would adopt that kind of burial method. Interesting, isn't it? But you who are a new creation don't have to be concerned about those things, do you? Because God has already given you your promise and fulfilled it, so if you text me or email me and say, what should I do? Do whatever you want, as long as you believe in the Messiah. So you're going to be raised to glory, yes? Well, you've got to rest on the Scriptures. All the Scriptures are true. So in Ada bore Jabal, and he was the father of those who live in tents and of those who have cattle. Who do we know today that live in tents and have cattle? Arabs. In Israel, Bedouins. Okay, nomadic tribes, the Bedouin tribes, when you go to Israel with us, we will go down into the Negev desert, and we will go to a Bedouin tribe that have a tent, and the tent might be as big as this, this uh, sanctuary. And they will cook us a meal in that tent. We will see their flocks and go shepherd their sheep and their goats and their camels and, and uh, sit there and have a, uh, Abraham's lunch the same way that it was prepared by Abraham when he had the three visitors. And you'll experience that, sitting in a desert, sitting in the sun, 
sitting in your door in the opening to your tent in the New Dane hour, but it won't be in July, August time frame. We'll be kind to you and take you in April all right, and spare you the 110, 120, 130 degree heat. But you have to imagine yourself, because you know the Bible, what was he thinking sitting there in the noon hour in the heat of the day? What was God stirring in him that he should be awaiting the visitation? So you need to really weigh into these kind of things and put it back in the historical context of, of uh, what you're reading and begin to understand logically and practically what the circumstances of the day were and understand that God was writing this so you, the reader, could understand what it meant to then and what it means to you now. This is not just a history book where you want to read about uh, Napoleon and Waterloo, and that has no relevance to me whatsoever today. This is a book that has relevance to you today as much as it did at the time of its giving. And this is what we're supposed to find out. But if we don't understand where they were and what they were doing and who they were doing it with, who was Moses writing this for? He was writing it for you and for I. And basically, Deuteronomy sums it up this way. <clears throat> for you who were not at Sinai, I give you this instruction. None of us were at Sinai. So I guess we need to heed and pay attention and weigh into it. That's why you need to come to this teaching on the Ten Commandments. Because it's going to uh, rock some worlds. It's going to undo a whole lot of stuff and make you realize that what you've been taught is not necessarily what's contained in the Bible. And Sunday school was great, but his word is greater than Sunday school. And I love all you Sunday school teachers, but we've, we've uh, parsed out Ten Commandments and we've thrown away 603, and we need to weigh into the words of Yeshua and uh, understand what the New Covenant contains. Very important message. Uh, when God was speaking to me about preaching on this, I said, are you serious? Are you serious? You want me to preach on the tent? It was almost like the conversation I had with him about preaching on dirt. Are you serious? You want me to actually preach? No, this is like a Sunday school teaching. No, I want you to preach on the Ten Commandments. All right, Lord, I'm going to do it. And uh, I don't think anybody left last night, did they? So I guess I didn't offend too badly. But uh, I'm going to continue with this and weigh into what the Lord shows me and reveals to me in His Word. See, it's 99% Scripture. You get a lot of Scripture here at Bethlehem. So, V'shem achiv yuval, chuchaya avi kotofes kinor veogav. And his brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all who handled the harp and pipe. So, Jubalation. Oh, connect the dots with your own language. How interesting. Jubilation. Jubal. Yes, yeah, still alive in our remembrance today, but we have no idea where our, what our word origins are and how we get to where we are, but we need to understand this. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who handled the harp and pipe. I love that. I just love the way the Word of God uh, just really comes to pass. Verse 22, Vetsila gamhi yada et tuval kain lotesh kol choresh nikushet uvarel vaachot tuval kain naama. And Zilla, she also bore tuval kain, forger of every sharp instrument in bronze and iron, and the sister of tuval kain was naama. Naama means pleasant. And according to rabbinical literature, Naamah was the wife of Noah. This is rabbinical teaching. This is not biblical teaching. This is rabbinical teaching. Where they got that, I don't know. I never know where they get it from, but I always like to throw it in there and you scratch your head and say, well, should I read the rabbinical literature? I have 42 years experience reading the rabbinical literature. You want 42 years? I say go to Sunday school that I went to. Go to Hebrew school. Go to Hillel Academy. Go to these things and get taught. For, for the first 15 years of my life, that's all I did. You went to elementary school and you went to religious school. 
and you went several times a week. And you were taught all the rabbis had to say about all kinds of things. And I even pursued it as an adult in my 20s in, a, in an Orthodox synagogue in, in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. For seven years was a part of that Orthodox community. Listening to the rabbinical, you want to do that? God bless you. Come back and see me when you've had enough. <laughs> but I came away from it at 42 years old saying, I just never heard anything about God. I heard about all the rabbis, and I can tell you about Akiva and Maimonides and, and uh, Hillel and, and even Schneerson. But I couldn't tell you anything about God. I had no idea what he had to say. And so this is the reason why, out of my new creation birth, that we weigh so much into Scripture, because you can get really distracted with the extra-biblical text. There's Dr. Conrad Baggett right over there, Ph.D. Okay, Ph.D., sitting in this class. Dr. Baggett, have you ever heard any of this stuff before? Three quarters. I know some of your teachers. James Rayford? Don't know him, but okay. I knew Dr. Radelnik. Yeah, well, I know him too. <laughs> But, but yes, probably three quarters to two thirds, maybe even up to 90%. Uh, but though I never understood the blood thing about the mark, would you repeat that? Sure. When you take a look at the mark referenced on Cain in uh, Genesis chapter, what is it, three or four? Uh, and you look at, at Exodus chapter 12, right, it says they'll put a mark, a sign on him. Right, it's the same sign, it's the same reference to the sign. What's the sign? You you put the blood. So what had to be on Cain? The blood. Imagine now if you had to walk down the street. Well, let's see. We can even see a reference to it in a remote way. And let me give you a real interesting disconnect. You walk down the street of India, and there's a group that bears a mark that nobody has anything to do with. They're called the untouchables. It's in a caste system a people who are identified with a particular mark that says have nothing to do with them. Now we know that this is birthed out of maybe uh, racism or it's birthed out of a hierarchy or birthed out of, or is it, does it have a biblical foundation in its own way? How about the lepers that had to cry out, unclean, unclean, so that people would part from them? Imagine what it is that's on them, what sign they bear. Well, they bore bandages and, and decay and things on them. It's why when Miriam fled and was put outside the camp that it was obvious what was going on with her to all she passed, but yet it was also obvious when she returned what had happened to her, the healing of God. And so we see these things that there are marks and there are signs. What is the sign of you being a believer? Anybody know? The Shekinah glory of God deposited in your heart. So let your light shine that man might see your good works and bring glory to your Father in heaven. By your fruit, you will judge whether a tree is good. So you have two signs in your life, by your fruit and by your light. And if you're not having evidences of fruit, then God's going to discipline you. But if you have evidence of fruit, God is going to prune you to make room for more new growth. I know a great book about a tree. I liked it. The Lord seemed to like it. He gave it to me. So you need to understand in the natural what God's showing us about the supernatural. And understand that in the beginning when God created this light, you need to really understand. I'm actually going to be doing a series starting in May called Or. It's a Hebrew word for light. And I'm actually going to preach on it for three months. Just light. You say, how can you get that much out of light? I don't know. Ask the Lord. He's the one that told me to do it. So starting in May, you'll be surprised at that, at that series. But uh, God's doing a great thing, and so you need to understand this. So you need to understand the mark, the mark you bear as a believer. 
you try to wear outward adornment. Maybe you wear a Star of David. Maybe you wear a cross. Maybe you wear a Star of David with a cross in it. Maybe you wear a grafted in. That's not your sign. Imagine if somebody overhears you in the grocery store. That's going to be your sign. Are you a blessing or are you a curse? We all bear a mark. But how do we demonstrate it? How do we show it to the world? How do we unveil it to the world? If people were to describe you, and I think I shared with you that, uh, and these are called rabbi trails, but it's important that you know. <laughs> when we were at the rabbi's conference and Daniel Harkavy was, uh, uh, he is a, uh, in the corporate world, he was a corporate leadership development person. And he's now moved his focus and his practice to developing ministry people. Leadership and ministry, healthy congregations, healthy congregational leaders. Uh, mega pastors sit under him to learn leadership. And uh, one of the things he said was, you need to write your own epitaph today, your own eulogy today. What will people say about you today? And then you need to match that up to what you want people to say about you and be begin living towards planting the seeds in your life. If they say, well, he was... Uh, you know, he was great in the pulpit, but as a dad, he was the worst dad. Well, you need to fix that. And so he gives you this exercise of doing not a death plan, but a life plan. He said, imagine what people walking by your coffin will look down and say about you. And I told you what I told him I wanted them to say. I wanted them to say, look, he's moving. <laughs> but what do you want people to say? And how will they say it if you don't start living like that? Don't you know if what you, if, if what you do is right that it will be accepted? This was the message to Cain. This is the message to you. Don't, won't you be accepted? It's not, it, he, he didn't say, won't it be accepted? He wasn't talking about from one offering to the next. He was talking about your acceptance, not your gift. The whole purpose of God was for you to be accepted by God. And conform to his patterns and to walk in his ways. And he gave us examples of people who didn't walk in his ways and the consequence. Yes, he is a generous and gracious and loving God, but he is a jealous God. He is the God that's introduced us to blessings and curses. We can't just walk in this, oh, I'd rather talk to Yeshua because he's so kind to me. If we fail to understand that he even says, in the end, everything will be subject to the Father, including the Son. Yes, it's all about coming to the Father through the Messiah. But if we don't really have a full grasp of God's plan, it was God's plan in the beginning, and now He gave a path through the Messiah. I've told you before, when you're talking to me, you're not talking directly to me, you're talking to me through the air. When you're on the phone with me, you're not talking to me directly, you're talking to me through the phone. When you're talking to the Lord, you're talking through Messiah. No one comes to the Father but through the Son. It does not stop with the Son. And so those who have been praying to Yeshua are missing a little bit of the message. And we need to understand that. The power and authority comes through the shed blood of Messiah to give us access to God. And therefore, by giving us access to God, the glory will never fade from us like it did from Moses. Because God placed His glory on Moses, God has deposited in you His glory, and therefore you should understand this deposit in your heart in this light that can never go out. It can never fade. It's as bright in you as today as it was the day it was deposited in you, but if you've covered it up with clothing and with, with sin and with dirt, it's time to clean it, to wash it clean and let it shine. And this is the message of God. This is a message contained within this, these passages in Genesis, and we need to understand the message to us today, as relevant today as it was when it was written. Vayomer Lemech and Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to my speech, for I have slain a man for wounding me and a young man for hurting me. Kishiv atayim, yukam kain velamech, shavim veshiva. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly lamech, seventy 
and sevenfold. Verse 25, Ve'yada Adam od et ishtu, v'taled ben v'tikra et shmo, shet kishat li, Elohim zera achir tachat chevel ki harago kain. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called him Seth. For God, said she, has appointed me another seed. For God, said she, has appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Third son of Adam and Eve. Seth means appointed or foundation. How interesting that Cain would try to build on another man's foundation, but God himself will provide the foundation. Accidental? Are names just randomly thrown into the Bible to give us no insight in the plan of God? Is your name? How many of you, I want you to look around now. Look around this room. How interesting that on the eighth day of my life, I was given the name Avraham Mendel Ber Ben Hirsch. Avraham. Not Abram, father, but Avraham, father of many. I have no biological children. None. Zero. Zip. Never have. No biological children. I have an adopted daughter and a stepson. I have no biological children. How then could God fulfill his naming of me, Avraham? Anybody ever see those kids run up here on Friday night? Look around you, spiritual sons and daughters, spiritual mothers and fathers, a family that is so great and so numerous that I am overwhelmed by it. Those who sit in my office and counsel with me every Wednesday and Thursday, and people ask, when can I have an appointment? Any Wednesday or Thursday, I'm always available. Wednesdays and Thursdays. Maybe not this week, but the next, there'll be an opening. You need to understand access. You have access to your Father in Heaven. You have access to who God has appointed to be the chief servant here at Bethel. Not the rabbi, not the overseer, not the pay homage to, but the chief servant. Isn't a father a servant to his family? Isn't that how he loves his wife is by serving her, esteeming her more than he esteems himself? Isn't this how a shepherd goes out in the middle of the night to save the sheep who would leave the 99 to get the one? I tell people in the new members class, listen, I will leave the 99 to get you, but when you're back with the 99, do not get upset with me when I leave you to go get that one. Oh, how interesting. I blew by 250 people to get to you the day you walked in the first day. To greet you and to welcome you here the first time and to shake your hand. I went past all the 99 to get to the one. Please don't get offended with me. When after I already know you and you're already a part of the family that I go to the next. Because that's how God wants to build. See, God's economy is different than man's economy. And we're very fragile. God doesn't want us to be fragile. You belong to a family. That's why we call you Mishpacha. You get invited to every family reunion, whether you show up or not, is up to you. You're never excluded from the family reunion. But Seth means appointed or foundation. And Seth would be the seed son to continue the Messianic bloodline. The seed son. Wow, I remember a seed. I remember a seed in the Garden of Eden that God spoke about. You mean he continues to talk about the seed, the seed, the seed, the seed, the seed, all the way through? Because God's plan is clear if we look for it. He is the God of decency and order. And what he introduced to us in the old will fulfill in the new. What he says will take place, we have to find the incidences where it takes place. And we can plot it and chart it. He tells us nothing by accident. And even when we don't see the connection between scriptures, we think, oh, this is just a one-off. There is no such thing as a one-off. It's all connected either to the heart of the matter or to how we are to live. And in verse 26, Ulishet gamchu yulad ben, vayikra et shmo inash az 
who called Likro Beshem Adonai, and to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called him Enosh, or Enoch. Then began men to call upon the Lord by name. What name? Hashem, the name, by name. Bashem Adonai. They began to call upon the name of the Lord by name. Trying to say the tetragram, yad heh vav heh is futile. He didn't give us the pronunciation. Now, as a reference point, if you say Jehovah, or you say Yahweh, as a reference point, it's putting a marker out there. I know who you're talking about. You just can't find it in the Bible. So I'd rather stick with biblical terms and refer to God the way God asked to be referred to, either as I am or the name Hashem. And so rather than when we say hallelujah, praise the Lord, or we say Baruch Hashem, bless His name, all very biblical. So are we legalistic and say, oh, you can't ever mention Yahweh or Jehovah? No. You can do what you want. But as for me and my house, we're going to line up with the Word of God. So when you go out into the public and you're talking about Yahweh and Jehovah, and you want to minister to one of the lost sheep of the house of Israel, you might hear the statement, oh, you're one of them. Well, you believe in the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, but you stick a J on his name, and there are no J's in Hebrew, so then I know that you might be one of them. <laughs> well, there's not supposed to be a them and there us, but there is a them and the us. There's only two people groups in the Bible, Jews and Gentiles. That's all there are. I hate to break the news to you, but that's all there is in the Bible. That's all. That's the only people groups there are, Jews and Gentiles. And God's torn down the middle wall of partition that we might come together as one in Messiah, that we might, that, what did Paul say? He said, to the Jew, I was a Jew. To the Greek, I was a Greek. I want to be all things to all people so that my people might know. The purpose of Bethel, to come together so that this light that emanates from this place up on a hill. How many of you know that we're at an elevation higher than the Islamic Center? Anybody know that? Yeah. How many know that the Star of David flies higher than the uh, Crescent Moon? How many of you know that? Okay. How many of you know how deliberate that that was? The highest point in Birmingham that a flag is flying is right here at Bethel El, okay, where the Star of David flies. All right, we've got one over there, and then we'll get Judy in a minute. Yes, Craig Metters. Yes, sir. Um, I'm in an industry that has many Jewish people, less today than before, but um, I have one or two friends that when we sit down to have a meal, I usually will ask, do you mind if I ask for God's blessing on this food. Oh, no, go ahead, go, go ahead, Craig. And when you get to that last part of the blessing, and I usually ask for a blessing on his family mm -hmm. and his business and on the food, and when I get to the last part, you would say, and I pray this prayer in... Yeshua's name. Okay. In Yeshua's name. Haven't you been out to lunch with me? Sure you have. <laughs> we ate over at that Mexican restaurant over, uh, right? But you're one of us yet. That's okay. <laughs> I don't shy away. I imagine now standing in Auschwitz, gathered with a group, standing in Auschwitz, the death camp, and I gathered our team together in the loudest voice possible. Who was there with me? Raise your hand if you were there with me at Auschwitz. Were you with Auschwitz? No, you're in Hungary. Auschwitz, who was there? Sowers, anybody here? Right there. There you go, Mark Ledbetter. Pretty loud, wasn't it? Pretty loud. In Yeshua's name, amen. Why? Because if you're ashamed of your faith in Messiah, you're not going to provoke anybody to envy. You might find that the fact that you bless the food 
you might find that that's the first time their food's been blessed. Oh yeah, we'd say the barucha up here for the bread, and maybe their grandfather says it at the table, or maybe Pop says it on Friday night, but that's about it. Most don't know that you pray in accordance with the three daily sacrifices in the temple. You happen to know those three times as breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They happen to correspond with the times of the three daily sacrifices. God didn't give you this appetite burning in you for breakfast, lunch, and dinner at some odd random time. It actually is in accordance with the daily sacrifices in the temple that occurred just about those times every day. That you might pray over your food and that you might pray three times daily. Now, you can say, Vashem Adonai. They might say to you, what does that mean? Because Hebrew is not the language of Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> How many of you know that? Okay. How many of you look at me when I'm reading the Hebrew and just look and go, oh, I like what he says, but I don't understand a single word of it. But we always give you a translation. That's why this is biblical speaking in tongues. How many of you know that we speak in tongues here at Bethel every single week we get together? Read the biblical interpretation. Somebody spoke a foreign language and somebody gave a translation. Okay? We do that every week here at Bethel El. It doesn't have to be, oh, are you telling me that you're Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled Jewish? That's exactly what I'm telling you. <laughs> there you go. That's what I'm talking about. All right, Judy, you had a question. Okay, we need the ushers down here. And was there another question? Somebody else had one, had a hand up. I see that hand in the back. I can't see your face, though. Who is that? Robert Sullivan, the Bulgarian prince, Robert Sullivan. All right. Yes, Judy. I, I have a comment and then a question. Um, ever since I learned that Hashem means the name, it, I don't know, it's kind of revolutionized the way um, I think about God. It's not, it, it's more, um, more of a father. I mean, I know Abba means father, but, you know, Hashem, anyway, I just really like that. But um, the, the other question. Well, I, well, let me just address that for a minute. Did you hear what she said? It ministers to her as an individual. This is not doctrine. You're not being told how you should pray. You've already been told how to pray. Pray in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That. You've already been told that. Whether you do that or not is entirely up to you. You have great freedom in Messiah. This is not a bunch of legalism. This is not trading on one set of rules and laws that we could not hold up under. It says, why do you exchange one yoke for another? Your relationship with God. Remember, and, and if you come to the Tuesday nights or you get the CDs, you're going to hear this. During Yeshua's ministry, three and a half years on earth, the first two were about the national resurrection, the national forgiveness of Israel. Once he was rejected by the Sanhedrin, he no longer concerned himself with matters of the national resurrection or the national salvation of Israel. He concerned himself only with the individual's salvation and the individual's forgiveness. That still is his ministry today. How you worship, how you're free to don a talit or not a talit or a keepa or not a keepa, whether or not you pray in Jehovah's name, Yahweh's name, Yeshua's name, Hashem's name, Bob's name, it's your personal relationship. And if anybody tells you you're doing it wrong, send them to me because that's just the inner Pharisee crying out to try to put one yoke on you that they themselves cannot meet. I don't sit in judgment. Messiah did not come to condemn the world. Then who am I to come in and condemn you for your practices? If you want to be ultra-Orthodox and religious, be ultra-Orthodox and religious. That's your choice. But if you try to impose it on somebody else, now I'm involved. What you do as an individual is between you and the Lord. When you try to impose that on somebody else and say, you're praying wrong, you're doing this wrong, then you got me to contend with. Because that's not biblical. Let's practice this. Repeat after me. I am not the Holy Spirit. 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 All right, you've confessed it. You're not the Holy Spirit. You are not sent to the world to condemn somebody else for how they do stuff. The Word of God is for instruction. How many of you follow every direction on the box? <laughs> how many of you have ever put something together and had parts left over? All right then obviously you don't follow all the instructions, do you? Okay, that's why we have grace and we have the shed blood of Messiah so that we don't have to. 
Our salvation is not predicated on everything that we do in obedience to a set of laws that we cannot fulfill. That's why it's called the New Covenant. But there is a measure that we are going to be measured by, and we need to understand that as well. All right, now for your question. Okay, the question is, um, I've, I've heard all this, the term the Sethite doctrine or Sethite theory. I think it's like a kind of like replacement theology or something like that. Can you? What does that, it? you know what they call that? Heresy? Biblically? Heresy? No, they call it strange fire. Oh, okay. Strange fire. What happened to the boys that brought, they said, don't bring strange fire into my house. Okay. You know, when you start talking about ites. Yeah. Okay. You've got the Hittites, the Jebusites, the termites, <laughs> the parasites. Uh, uh, you know, all the, anything that you hear the word doctrine, theology, this kind of thing, is man's effort to compact a teaching, put their name on it, and introduce you to something that says, I understand this better than you, and you need to think the way I think. Guess what? The book that sits out on that table has my name on it, meaning this is my opinion. I'm very clear about this is my opinion of my understanding of the Word of God. If you want to take this instruction, praise the Lord. But if you don't, praise the Lord. This is not some new theology. This is an interconnection of Scripture where God was showing us things in the natural that He was revealing supernatural truths. That's great. You should study to show yourself approved. But what happens is people get bumped off the path. How many of you feel like you know the Word of God? Good. That means none of us. Now, how many of you want to depend on somebody else's opinion for your instruction? How many of you, when you grow older, want somebody to feed you? Isn't that your desire? Oh, I just want to be in a chair and somebody's going to have to feed me. Isn't that your desire? No, but why do you do it spiritually then? Why do you allow man to spoon feed you what he wants you to know about Scripture when this book is available to every one of you? And God will give you revelation that's your revelation because you asked for it. Don't rest on my revelation. God revealed stuff to me I'm not even allowed to share with you. God will reveal things to you about His truth in your life and your understanding. Go get it. It says if anybody lacks wisdom, ask for it. There's great books out there. Dr. Baggett had to write something in order to get his Ph.D., Right? Dr. Rankin had to write something in order to get his Ph.D. How many other Ph.D.s do we have in here? You all had to write something in order to get your doctorate. But they will tell you that this was their view of what this was their theory, this was their hypothesis, and they proved to their hypothesis. It might have been 10, 20, 30 years ago, and their understanding now is completely different than it was at the time they presented their argument. But the argument was a good, solid, rational argument, and they said, okay, you've demonstrated your ability to think like a Ph.D. They don't always have to agree with your hypothesis or with your results, but the fact that you logically shown them and demonstrated them and could defend which was what it was about. Rabbi Sasha had to go defend his doctorate, and Rabbi Sasha's doctorate was in structural engineering, just so you know, using vines instead of rebar to strengthen concrete and prove that vines were a better solution to reinforcing concrete than rebar. And he designed an entire structure using nothing but vines and he was able to prove that the load that could be borne by vines because they had more flexibility and they were fibrous as opposed to rigid like rebar was a better solution for construction by using vines. That's the brilliant mind he had. And he defended that. And in, in uh, the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, you defend it by taking 16 whiteboards. And you start at the beginning of the board and you begin to present. And you have eight judges sitting there Right? firing arguments at you at every step, and you write it out. There's no PowerPoint. There's no, you write it out. You have to defend your position. He designed that building right there in front of them using all his math and proved his point that vines are a better structural solution than rebar. Amazing. Amazing. And he's a rabbi. Right. <clears throat> Frank, you want to tell me about engineering, buddy? Yeah, I know you do. I know why, too. Because that's what you are. Yeah, I just want to confirm what you said. Uh, I've, de I've designed many structures, and it's, uh, 
uh, in my experience, it's been a battle on which uh, really acts first, the concrete or the rebar or the steel. And his theory is that uh, the so-called vines, uh, what happens, it actually picks up the tension first. So it basically blocks out the, the uh, so-called tension load that's in the concrete, whereas the concrete is all in compression. Whereas if you use rebar, there's an amount of tension. So, I like what you said. I have no idea what it is. Yeah. I liked every word that came out of your mouth, but I have no idea what you're talking about. But I agree with you completely. What, what it means is... But wait a second. We, we can't use a Bible. We can't use our Torah study for, for our engineering lesson. That was just an example of one man's opinion being presented yeah. and the way books are written and the way arguments are given. And this is why when we see and we see something's called this theology or this theory or this that it's one man's interpretation. Does that mean they're wrong? It does not mean they're wrong. This is not a commentary that every book that's out there is wrong. It means that if you don't know the Bible and you don't know what God says, how are you going to defend against what you read? It's just going to come into you and you're going to have that as your foundation and you're drawing on it without any biblical defense for your position. You need to know the Bible first. People want to read books because they're easier to read than the Bible. I found the Bible to be the easiest read of my life because I made that decision, it was going to be the easiest read of my life. And if you don't like reading the Bible, come here every morning from, 10, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. and have the Bible read to you. You can read the Bible out loud in 70 hours. That's from Genesis to Revelation. At an average reading speed, you can read the Bible out loud, meaning you see it, you say it, and you hear it in 70 hours. pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah. All right, people tell you, oh, well, you need to have this one-year read Bible reading plan. Here at Bethel we read the Bible out loud four times a year. Yeah. Out loud. Come. Come sit with us. And so Seth means a point of foundation. He'd be the seed son. Seth gave birth to Enoch, meaning human frailty. Human frailty. In Enoch's day, man began to call upon the name of the Lord, a Hebrew idiom for regular religious worship in a public way. Calling upon the name of the Lord, what do we do here when we gather together for worship? Now it becomes a public, right? The doors are open, the windows are open, we're gathered together in an assembly, so there was a form of regular worship, and it's idiomatic, meaning this is what it came to be believed as in the Jewish world, as to what he was doing. So when you say Baruch Hashem, when you say hallelujah, when somebody sings and you go hallelujah, what are you doing? Praise the Lord, calling upon the name of the Lord. And so we need to understand that. All right, we're moving into chapter 5. Uh, and and uh, what happens is, is what God does. He gives us a toldot, the book of generations. Why? How many of you know where your family is from? How many of you care? Okay, I cared. I took a whole team to Odessa to buy into my pursuit of where did my family come from. I thought I was searching for the hidden mystery of uh, the Aaron Prices and the Stearns and all the people in my life with those great Jewish, strong Jewish names. Because I'm a walker. But that was changed from the Hungarian name. As my father came here and the family name was changed. But genealogy and generations, first of all, my identity as a Jewish man is confirmed by my Jewish parents, my Jewish grandparents, my Jewish great-grandparents, my Jewish great-great-grandparents, my Jewish great-great-great-great-grandparents, and all the way down the line as my lineage, as my bloodline. What about those that were forced into conversion? What about those that go to be tested and they find out that they have Yes, there's genetic markers. Actually, Israel is reviewing today, as we speak in, in Israel, uh, the laws regarding whether or not if you have DNA proof of your Jewish identity as to whether or not you can be recognized for the law of return as being a Jewish descendant. And they're, they're debating this. The Shas party is debating this as the Ministry of the Interior is debating this. Now, you may find that you have a genetic disposition for being connected to the Levites. I can pretty much assure you I do not. I'm from a working class 
family. I'm not from a Levitical priesthood. Okay? In God's economy, we are all given a royal priesthood. That's how I can be a rabbi today, even though I'm not a Kohanim, I'm not a Kohen. Yet my mother's father was. My mother's father was. But the lineage of the Levite and the Kohen passed to his firstborn son, not to his daughter. And therefore, although my grandfather was a Kohen, I am not. His, my Uncle Alan's son, Neil, and Neil's son, I don't even remember his name, but that's where the line, the line goes. Well, how interesting. You mean families can be divided? Oh, yes. We see division and genealogy and family trees and splits and branches, and we need to understand that. So as we come into Genesis chapter 5, anybody have any questions about Genesis chapter 4, about, about Cain, about Abel, about uh, this, this uh, new genealogy that we're about to be given because we're now heading down a path. And this is what God does. When you take the highway, when I leave here to go to Rainsville tomorrow, I'll go on a different different set of paths. I'll head up one highway and I'll turn off that highway and head to another one I'll turn in order to get to my final destination. God's taking us to a destination. That destination happens to be Messiah. Now once you understand the new covenant identity in Messiah, now we go back and we resurrect, we recreate our deep, deep connection with the scripture so that we understand that we couldn't, listen, your destination is secure if you're a believer in Yeshua. So then why, when you become a believer in Messiah, don't, aren't you just sucked up right then? So you're no longer living for the destination, are you? You're now in this ambassadorship during the journey. You're now charged with going out and making disciples of men. You're now charged with a new covenant life. Freedom in Messiah. Freedom to what? Freedom to reflect the love and the grace of Yeshua into lives of others, to be a living example to others so that they could see Yeshua in you. If they can't see Yeshua in you, you've got to cover it up with a bunch of worldly stuff. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? You've been a call to people set apart. You don't have to be a bloodline Levite in order for you to be given a kingship, and a priesthood from God because your DNA, your spiritual DNA has been changed. You can't be born again of the flesh, meaning if you don't have Jewish DNA, you don't have Jewish DNA. But you can be born again of the Spirit because that was the message that Yeshua preached to Nicodemus. And so you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And now your spiritual DNA has to be Jewish because you're grafted in and you draw upon the nourishment of the commonwealth of Israel. And when you understand that and we share in the blessings, we share in the inheritance, me a natural branch, you may be a natural branch or a wild branch, does not matter. You're still drawing on the nourishment of the root of Israel and the Jewish people. And you are entitled to that because of your faith in Yeshua. Amen? All right, we hit 11.55. I'm going to take a break here. I'm going to pray over you, dismiss those that are not here for the new members class, and encourage those who are here for the new members class. Be back in here right at 12 o'clock for us to get started. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face toward you and give you His peace as we send you out today. In the name of Yeshua, we wish you a Shabbat Shalom and a Shavuot Tov. Have a great week until we see you again Tuesday, 11.30, Tuesday at 7, Friday at 7.30, and Saturday at 10.30. Shalom, be Yeshua, peace, and Messiah, you are dismissed.